Roberto Clemente, Pride of the Pittsburgh Pirates, by Jonah Winter, illustrated by Raul Colon. Roberto Clemente. On an island called Puerto Rico, where baseball players are plentiful as tropical flowers in a rainforest, there was a boy who had a very little but a fever to play and win at baseball. He had no money for a baseball bat, so he made one from a guava tree branch. His first glove he also made from the cloth of a coffee bean sack. His first baseball field was muddy and crowded with palm trees. For batting practice, he used empty soup cans and hit them farther than anyone else. Soup cans turned into softballs. Softballs turned into baseballs. Little League turned into minor league, which turned into winter league, professional baseball in Puerto Rico. He played so well. He played so well, he received an invitation to play in the major leagues in America. What an honor. But the young man was sent to a steel mill town called Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where his new team, the Pittsburgh Pirates, was in last place. Now, this was something very strange, being on a losing team. For the young Puerto Rican, everything was strange. Instead of palm trees, he saw smokestacks. Instead of Spanish, he heard English. Instead of being somebody, he was nobody. His first time at bat, he heard the announcer stumble through the Spanish name, Rob uh, Robert. Um, let's see, To Clement. It echoed in the near empty stands. Roberto Clemente was his name, and this is pronounced Roberto Clemente. As if to introduce himself, Roberto smacked the very first pitch. But it went right up the infield and into a second baseman's glove. Still, Roberto ran like lightning and beat the throw of first base. The Pittsburgh's fans cheered their, sco their scorecards. Who is this guy, Roberto Clemente? To his new fans in Pittsburgh, Roberto was like a jolt of electricity. He could score from first base on a single. He could hit line drives, bunts, towering home runs, sacrifice flies, whatever he was needed. Once he even scored an inside the park grand slam. Playing right field, he had no equal. He was always leaping, diving, crashing and rolling. Once, trying to catch a pop fly running full speed, he slammed right into the right field wall and fell to the ground. At last, slowly he lifted his glove and the ball was inside. But it wasn't just how he played. He had style. He was cool. He had this move he did with his neck before each at bat, cracking it to one way and then the other. Soon, kids who wanted to be like Roberto was doing, were doing it too, twisting their necks this way and that. Roberto did it to ease the pain he felt from playing his heart out in every game. If you don't try as hard as you can, he said, you're wasting your life. Roberto tried so hard. He helped the last place Pirates make it all the way to the World Series, where they beat the mighty New York Yankees.
After the series down the streets of Pittsburgh, Roberto walked along among his fans who were so busy celebrating. They didn't even notice him. That didn't bother Roberto. He was happy to feel lost in the crowd and of a party he had helped create. But there was something that would have made Roberto's joy a little sweeter. As much as fans loved him, the newspaper writers did not. When Roberto was in such pain he couldn't play, they called him lazy. They mocked his Spanish accent, and when Roberto got angry, the mainly white newsman called him a Latino hothead. Roberto swore he would be so good, he would have to get the respect he deserved. He would become the greatest all-around baseball player there ever was. At home that Christmas, Roberto went back to the same muddy field he played on as a boy. In his pockets was a bag full of bottle caps that he emptied into the hands of some kids. They threw him the caps and he hit each one again and again. When he returned to Pittsburgh come spring, baseball looked huge and he clobbered them as never before. That season he hit .351, the highest batting average in the National League. He still did not get the credit he deserved for being so great. It's because I'm black, isn't it? He asked the sneering reporters. It's because I'm Puerto Rican. It's because I'm proud. It was starting to seem as if Roberto might never be respected. In the big world outside of Pittsburgh and Puerto Rico, and then something happened. The year was 1971. The Pirates were in the World Series again, playing against the Baltimore Orioles, who were favored to win. All around American and Puerto Rico, people sat and watched the TV. As Roberto put on a one-man show, stealing bases and hitting home runs, playing right field with fire most fans had never seen before. Finally, finally, it could not be denied. Roberto was the greatest all-around baseball player of his time, maybe of all time. The very next year, he did something that few had ever done. During the last game of the season, Roberto walked to the plate, cracked his neck, dug in his stance, sunk his chin toward the pitcher, and walloped a line drive off the center field wall, his 3,000th hit. The crowd cheered and they wouldn't stop cheering. For many minutes, the players stopped playing and Roberto stood on second base amazed how far he had come. And yet, when the season was over, the hero returned to the place where the story began. To the land of the muddy fields and the soup cans and bottle caps, to his homeland of Puerto Rico where he worshipped. But he, did he sit around and polish his trophies? No. That rainy New Year's Eve, Roberto sat in the San Juan airport and waited for the mechanics to fix a tired old airplane that would take him to Central America. There had been a terrible earthquake and he wanted to help the victims. The plane would carry food and supplies that Roberto had paid for. Right before midnight, he boarded the rain. He boarded. The rain was really coming down. One of the propellers buzzed loudly as the plane took off. The engines failed and the plane fell into the ocean. Just like that, it was over. Roberto was gone. How could his story end this way, so suddenly and with such sadness? The story doesn't end here. When someone like Roberto dies, his spirit lives on in the hearts of all he touched. And Roberto's spirit is still growing. It grows in the bats and the gloves and the arms and legs of all the Latino baseball players who have flooded into the major leagues. 
His spirit grows in the charities he started for poor people in Puerto Rico. And his spirit is still growing in Pittsburgh, where people who saw him play tell their children and grandchildren of how he used to sparkle, running, diving, firing game-saving throws from deep right field all the way back to home plate, smack right into the center's glove. An author's note of Roberto Clemente, born on August 18, 1934. In Carolina, Puerto Rico, died on December 31, 1972, near San Juan, Puerto Rico. What do people think when they think of Roberto Clemente? Some baseball fans think of him as the greatest player who ever lived. They think of his statistics, 3,000 hits, 12 gold gloves awarded for his legendary fielding, 14 All-Star Game appearances, a regular season Most Valuable Player Award, 1966, a World Series Most Valuable Player Award, 1971, and .317 lifetime batting average, and the honor of being the first Latino inducted and in the fastest time ever into the American Baseball Hall of Fame. But that's only half the story. When many people hear the name Roberto Clemente, they think of the great person. Many people think of a man who died while trying to help earthquake victims. They think of a man who gave much of his money to charities. They think of a man whose money helped to build a sport complex in Puerto Rico for poor children. So they would have the chance to do as he did, to escape poverty through their athletic abilities. In his native Puerto Rico, Roberto Clemente is still worshipped like a saint. As a husband and father, he is still missed by his wife, Vera, and their three sons, Roberto Jr., Luis Roberto, and Roberto Enrique.